It takes a major stretch of the imagination to believe that not that many years ago, this flattened landscape was the hub of the world's busiest seaport, London Docks. The once bustling quaysides are now deserted. Through decades, those hefty bollards secured thousands of ships. Now they might just find use as a seat for the occasional nostalgic visitor. The great lock through which the constant stream of ships entered the docks is wedged closed and redundant. The faithful and mighty cranes stand lifeless on the windy landscape, monuments of a great era. The industry may have died, but memories of the docks are still very much alive in the minds of those whose livelihoods depended on this great shipping centre. George Shaw OBE was dockside manager here for one of the world's leading shipping lines, the New Zealand and Federal Steamship Company. Well, I know 30 years ago I used to sit on this bollard and if anybody had told me then that I would be watching an aircraft taking off from an international airport, I would have thought they were crazy. To think this was one of the busiest seaports in the world. Now, who would have believed it? What, here? Right here, where we're sitting. They used to have the ropes, the mooring ropes from the ships were taken down here, and there would be the ship here, and out there would be barges, and there were sheds, and there were hundreds of people around here. Pick a day like today, there'd be ships coming along to berth to start discharging cargo. There'd be one down there which was sailing maybe to South Africa, or South America. Did it used to be really foggy? Oh, fogs, they were the most awful things we used to have here. In fact, it used to bring shipping to a halt. They couldn't move on the river to come up and dock because they hadn't got the sophisticated radar they had. So they used to have to anchor down off South End and wait for the fog to clear. The ships in the dock couldn't sail. So everybody used to be hanging about, hoping for it to clear. And uh, people had to be very careful when they came to join their ships because you could easily fall into the water here. The activity was absolutely immense, but now all we can see is one aeroplane. Well, there we are, Anna. It's hard to imagine this was one of the busiest seaports in the world. And when I think of the traffic out there, the noise, the bustle and the congestion of it, I find it hard to think that that was possible. So I don't know about you, but you just close your eyes and see if you can imagine what it was like. Try to go back with George and imagine those long gone days when through the early morning mist, heavy traffic from all over the country would cram in to trundle through London's narrow cobbled streets. There were some quite extraordinary and vast loads carried. Everything converged here in the bustling docklands which were geared up and quite used to handling anything and everything. Special Port of London Authority trains would deliver countless wagons of freight destined for export to all corners of the globe. And this walled city within the city was a notorious centre of crime. It needed its own special police force to fight against the constant problems of smuggling and all manner of dockside villainy generated by all sorts of people from all over the world. To the outsider, though, this was a mighty and fascinating hive of industry. The gigantic load swinging on the cranes. A constant buzz of activity with everyone working to some precise schedule to make sure that these anonymous crates and containers would be loaded into the right hold to travel thousands of miles to some remote destination. There was always a majestic panorama of ships of all shapes and sizes arrayed bow to stern for as far as the eye could see. Each proudly flew its colours of some of the world's most famous shipping companies. P&O, Cunard, Shaw Savile, Royal Mail, Portline, British India, Union Castle, the New Zealand and Federal Steamship Company. A massive list. 
over 3,000 ships passed into the docks through this lock alone in one year, under the experienced control of the Port of London Authority officers. Maintaining an operation like this, round the clock and nearly every day of the year, demanded meticulous planning and rigorous organisation. Sunday and the lock round to 9 King George for one day up then up to 11 King George to complete. Timing and coordination was every bit as testing as the work of today's air traffic controllers. Each new arrival had to be rapidly fitted into a berth only just vacated by a departing ship. Dockers had to be trained to handle every imaginable type of cargo. With any ship likely to take on up to 30 different types of cargo, each requiring its own handling technique, much depended on the shore staff who had to map out the complicated logistics involved in the many processes. They had to know where each stowage was and how it was to be got into the hold and make sure that there were no bottlenecks or idle gangs. But London had its rivals. The great seaport of Liverpool was another magnet for cargo liners of the world. Here, the New Zealand shipping company's Otayo is taking on her cargo of valuable Made in Britain exports for delivery on a round-the-world voyage. And, of course, the great ports suffered all conditions. Here in London, in bitter frosty early morning fog, everything has to go on as normal so that no beat of the untiring rhythm of the docks is interrupted. Just to make life even chillier, some people had to handle frozen meat. The cargo liner crews couldn't expect breaks on high days and holidays. For this port line ship, it was going to be Christmas under full steam, and they would make the best of it. The perishable cargoes came up from deep inside the refrigerated holds to be put onto barges which would take them further upriver to huge warehouses. Shaw Savile's Dominion Monarch gets some masthead decoration while the handling is speeded up so that she can sail before the Christmas holiday. At 26,500 tonnes, and one of the largest liners to use London's Royal Docks, Dominion Monarch leaves her berth to start her voyage around the world. In a steady stream, carefully attended by the busy tugs, ship after ship slip from their moorings. Dominion Monarch dominates the lock. Then she turns slowly towards Galleon's Reach and into the deep water channel, carefully navigating downriver past the belching smoke of the tireless factories and power stations. As she goes, a myriad of ships from all over the world are waiting their turn to berth. Princess is at the bottom of the reach. Go up with her to King George Dock. Sun 17 will be the other tug with you. Got it all right? Over and down. 
Just what was it like to have sailed in those days on those beautiful ships? Where did they go and what were their missions? The Haparangi is bound for New Zealand. and a Blue Star vessel sets off for South America. A federal cargo liner makes off to Australia. We're recreating the stories of these long ago voyages with rare film of four of these ships taken during that era, piecing together a unique picture on board as they spanned the world. Our story starts with the Federal Steam Company's new tanker, the Kent. She noses her way out of the Isle of Grain, past her sister ship, the Derby. This is the start of a voyage to the Middle East. cross-channel ferry from Calais speeds by, making her way into the shelter of Dover Harbour. The Kent sails on past the unmistakable Seven Sisters before dropping off her channel pilot and turning towards the open sea. Also outward bound is the New Zealand Shipping Company's refrigerated cargo cadet ship, Otayo, on a similar course to the Kent, but this time out of Liverpool on her way round the world. Soon, hard at work, a complement of 70 cadets begin to learn the hard way about how to become first-class seamen. Some of them will rise up to become deck or engineering officers, passing those skills on to other new cadets. Strenuous work and strenuous play the young men need to keep very fit for their first long voyage. The Kent was the third ship of her company to bear that proud name. At over 31,000 tons, the Kent was built at the Clyde shipyards of John Brown and Co. and completed in December 1960. Her single screw double reduction geared turbines developed some 18,000 SHP at her service speed of 16 and a half knots. She would burn 116 tons of fuel oil a day using 75 gallons to the nautical mile. That's less than 30 yards to the gallon.
plain sailing so far, but that sense of security disappears as the barometer starts to drop as she turns south towards the Bay of Biscay. the storm abates, making way for some much better days as the Kent reaches the calmer waters of the Mediterranean. Now comes the routine of testing out the high-powered hoses used to flush out her cargo-carrying tanks, ready to take on some 40,000 tonnes of crude oil. Life on all these cargo ships could be exhaustingly hard work and meal times were much appreciated breaks from the routine. Here the crew and the cadets on a tayo make short work of Cook's mess room catering. Not quite up to mum's home cooking but everything is polished off. Otayo, on her Middle East run, reaches her first destination, Port Said. For many of those rookie cadets, this is their first sighting of a strange and distant land. But there's familiar company, with old friends from London lined up, waiting their turn to enter the Suez Canal. A senior cadet takes the ship's helm, under the watchful eye of Otayo's captain and the Egyptian pilot. It can be a hazardous transit through this very narrow waterway. It may be scorching hot up on the bridge. It's even hotter down in the engine room. After several hours of precise navigation, Atayo reaches the end of the canal and the Red Sea port of Aden. Here, the ship's engineers prepare to take on enough fuel oil to get her around the world. This will see her engines guzzle around 41 tons of oil every day, 25 gallons per nautical mile, one for every 80 yards she sails. As the fuel is piped on board, some members of the crew can use their spare time to buy their souvenirs from some of Aden's notorious bum boats, a case of buyer beware very often. Catching up with the Kent's progress, she's not that far behind. Her crew are now in regulation whites as she sails deeper into the Med towards Suez. No pressures, so officers' wives take a dip in the ship's pool. Then, in Atayo's wake, the Kent starts its passage through the canal. When fully loaded, her deep draft forced her to keep to the deepest water, giving her even less room to manoeuvre in the narrow channel. Other ships from the UK took the westerly course to the Antipodes. Here, a shore saville liner stops at Curacao in the Caribbean. Here, a Blue Star liner is in Cologne at the Caribbean end of Panama, ready to pass through the Panama Canal.
Back to the Kent, which by now has left the Suez Canal and is passing another of the company's ships homeward bound for England. And the Atayo has reached the immense Indian Ocean. For crew and cadets, the program of maintaining the ship seems to be unending. There's the constant problem of rust to deal with and painting it to hold it at bay. Four weeks after first setting sail from Liverpool, a tayo finally reaches Australia. The pilot comes aboard to guide her safely through Sydney Harbour to her berth. For the cadets, an exciting first glimpse of the legendary Harbour Bridge. But it's a short stop in Sydney. It isn't until Otayo gets to Auckland in New Zealand that her cadets get some well-earned and much-anticipated shore leave. And there's a bonus, another of the company's training ships, the Rakaia, is in port. And there's the chance to say hello to some old friends. Over 11,000 miles away from home, Auckland seems strangely English, but not quite English. They drive on the left, that's good. Not so sure about their sculptures, though. Atayo's cadets can enjoy long drifting hours of sunshine and discover the delights of Auckland's blue waters. Nice to be able to take command of a vessel, even if it is only a dinghy. Another ship taking the westerly course out from England and around the world is Shaw Savile's Northern Star. She's reached the Pacific island of Fiji going a little further south of Fiji and we find the Federal Steamship's Huntingdon. She's Auckland bound as well. Her skipper is Captain Jack Guiner. Even though this is the 44th time I've seen the New Zealand coastline on the horizon since I left Glasgow as a lad, it still gives me a kick. A lovely country. No wonder a quarter of our officers marry and make their homes there. Like myself one day. Back again to catch up with progress on the Kent. After completing her outward bound voyage, she's resting in the blistering heat of a Middle East port, taking on a cargo of crude oil. Meanwhile, other ships are having an extraordinary get together. It seems very strange how many of these ships were all alongside one another in UK ports just a few weeks ago, loading up their cargoes. Now, by their different routes, they've come together again in the welcome New Zealand warmth to journey around the picturesque coast.
There's cargo to collect from a list of very English place names. Wellington, the harbour of the capital. The deep sea harbour of Port Chalmers. A smaller picking up point at New Plymouth. <laughs> Nestling among the steep hills is Littleton, not far from Christchurch. <laughs> Napier, a town that expanded rapidly with brisk trade. And finally back to Auckland again. Those crews reveled in their six to eight week stays ashore. Many of them succumbed to the appeal of New Zealand and came back later to make it their home. Shaw Savile, Blue Star, Portline, Elements, they were all part of the port party to be found lined up in Auckland. Despite this happy environment, for Captain Guyler, Christmas was getting too close. He was very keen to set sail before the holidays closed down operations and left him stranded in port for weeks. His orders from London were to be at sea on the 23rd of December. It was already the 18th and there was a lot more cargo still to load onto the Huntingdon. Otayo's crew were also busily trying to keep to schedule. It was vital that the refrigerated cargo should be stored at exactly the right temperatures and tests were taken. Otayo's elaborate refrigeration plant was under the strict control of the ship's refrigeration officers who were charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the cargo survived in the searing heat of the tropics to arrive in England as fresh as the day it was loaded here in New Zealand. Things did go wrong on these long voyages with so much machinery and equipment on board. Halfway across the world to Galveston in the United States and here's the federal ship's Durham. A serious mechanical fault has paralyzed her. So a sister ship, the Haparangi, had to be dispatched to rescue that precious cargo. Meanwhile, the anxious Captain Guyler is hoping that the Huntington will be ready to sail. The company's shipping manager getting the last of her cargo aboard only just before the port shut down for those long Christmas holidays.
frantic dash with vital last-minute cargo, the Christmas tree for the mess and some goodies, the ones that didn't fall into the harbour. But happily, already well lashed to the mainmast, is the other tree, and Huntingdon finally leaves what has become a second home for Panama and then London. After two days out into the warm Pacific Ocean, it is indeed Christmas, celebrated in style and enjoyed all the more when everyone had the bonus of extra pay and leave for being at sea over Christmas time. Otayo was on the move as well, making good headway across the Pacific to Panama. Service speed 70 knots from her two sets of Doxford engines, which could develop 12,400 SHP. The cadets, who wanted to become engineer officers, had a lot to learn in the engine room. Alongside officers of the watch, they would go through the vital routines to check that everything was running smoothly. All cadets were expected to grasp the basic principles of engineering, how the two-stroke diesel engine functioned, for example. This was very thorough training for what could become a lifelong career. Also on board, the more technically-minded cadets would receive intensive hands-on training in the instructional and repair shops, extensively equipped with all the necessary machine tools. Cadets worked alongside the watchkeeping engineer officer, confronted by the mass of dials and instruments which constantly monitored the pulse of the ship. From all manner of meters and dials, they would have to learn healthy and unhealthy signs coming from the main and the refrigerating machinery rooms. Atayo was a fully equipped floating training college. Teenagers who might have found lessons boring in school had the gentle hum of the engines to remind them that while they were learning, they were going somewhere. The life of young cadet seamen was not all hard slog and training. They did relax, reading, writing home, some great letter writers telling much, although of course not quite all, about their times ashore. There was strong companionship among them. And on a busy ship, they could find peace and privacy in their own comfortable cabins. On Huntingdon, her crew had now recovered from their Christmas festivities and were back into the routine of that essential ship's maintenance. In the early morning warmth of the Pacific, nearly 3,000 miles from New Zealand, they reached the Polynesian Pitcairn Islands, a tiny British colony founded by nine mutineers from the infamous Bounty. But this is not a rerun of what they did to Captain Bly. Captain Guyler's very much in charge of lifeboat drill. This is Panama, and coming up, the journey through the famous canal.
Brooklyn here, passing through the Panama Canal, is trying to cope with the sticky tropical humidity. It's a stark contrast from the equally hot but more manageable dry heat of the sands of Suez. As Huntington negotiates the narrow waterway, Shaw Savile's liner Southern Cross passes by on her world circuit. At 11,281 tonnes, Huntingdon was built at the Glasgow yards of Stephen and Sons. Powered by two six-cylinder Doxford diesel engines, she developed 12,800 shp at her service speed of 16 knots. But at this stage, the strain was taken by the canal's mighty little engines, known fondly by all the ship's crews as mules. In those days, Panama couldn't match Auckland for civilization, but the little shanty towns offered a host of friendly bars and many very friendly women. It always came as a great relief to the company's agent when he saw the ship safely out of port the following morning. Clear of the canal and steering on an east-northeasterly course, Huntingdon sailed through the Caribbean, along the coast of Colombia, on her way to the beautiful Dutch West Indian island of Curaçao less romantically, a centre for petrol refining, but better known for the heady liqueur which took its name. Pretty 18th century houses and other pretty sights. and somewhere to do a little bartering with the local traders. At Curaçao, the ship would refuel, a very expensive operation. The Huntingdon's thirst was considerable, quaffing 46 tonnes of fuel oil a day. 28 gallons per nautical mile at her service speed of 16 knots, 72 yards to the gallon. But of course, a lot of that fuel was needed to keep the refrigeration generators going. Out from Curaçao and into the last leg of a long but successful voyage home. Of course, things hadn't gone so smoothly for the Durham. Stuck in Galveston, the stricken ship waited for parts to come from the builder's yards. Some of her crew and cadets were sent back to England as passengers on the American cargo liner Thompson Likes. Built during the Second World War, she was a standard American-class vessel of only around 8,000 tonnes, with a service speed of some 13 knots. This hiccup in the routine was a clear indication to the cadets that life at sea could be unpredictable. Mechanical breakdowns and other problems would upset timetables and lead to a lot of boring hanging about. No problems for the Kent. In fine fettle in the Med, she was nearing the end of her homeward voyage, rounding the Rock of Gibraltar on a northerly setting for the Bay of Biscay and Blighty.
but winter storms in the Atlantic were starting to rage as the Thompson Lake steered her course for Manchester, and the barometer was falling rapidly, spelling out the threat of even worse weather to come. Not far behind the Thompson Lakes and the Huntingdon was the Atayo making her way through the Panama Canal. Out in the Blue Caribbean, the deck cadets are helping the deck officers to fix the ship's position using the sun at midday. By using a familiar landmark, such as the Sombrero Lighthouse, the cadets could confirm their calculations and the exact position of the Atayo as she sailed from the Caribbean into the Atlantic. Its current calm gives no hint of the dangers that lie ahead. Suddenly, crew and cadets are put on full alert as the warning comes of a fierce, full-blown cyclone looming up. This is not schoolroom textbook stuff, but a real chance to be hands-on in learning about the behaviour of a cyclone and to help prepare for the worst. Atayo does suffer some damage in the ferocious seas that she encounters, but she survives to get to calmer conditions and approaches home waters. The Thompson Lights has managed to miss the worst of the weather and has reached the entrance of the Manchester Ship Canal. There's no mistaking it, smoky, grimy, but after all those problems in Galveston, what a welcome sight. 
After the expanses of the rough Atlantic, it's almost claustrophobic, all those other vessels waiting their turn. And there's work to be done, taking the ship to pieces. Her crew have to remove her mast tops and funnel so that she can get under the low bridges. Not like Suez or Panama, it's cold and grey, but it's a special canal because it leads home. The Manchester Ship Canal was opened in 1894. It runs for 36 miles, peanuts after the voyages of most of these ships. The canals can take vessels of up to 15,000 tonnes, almost to the city centre. There's one of the low-slung reasons for shortening the masts and taking off the funnel. This obligatory keeping your head down changes ships' appearances completely. Another of the company's ships, the Sioux Likes, is scarcely recognisable as she goes outward bound to the States. Just one last lock and swing bridge to contend with before the Thompson Likes can berth right in the centre of England's industrial heartland, Manchester. Relatively unscathed by the weather, the Huntingdon even gets a few more touches of paint so that she can look her best on her return to London. Inevitably, after six months away, everyone's excited on board, a condition known as the channels. They all look forward to seeing their families and loved ones again. Inevitably, there's a little impatience in the misty English morning as the Huntingdon has to wait her turn in the queue for berths. As always, those friendly, dependable tugs are there to greet the weary travellers and guide them in. Those old Thames barges and the cranes are so grubbly beautiful after all the months away. While in Liverpool, the pilot is waiting for Otayo. There's an end of voyage inspection by the managing director of the New Zealand Shipping Company, and all is correct. So no time is wasted in getting ashore to hurry home to family and friends. With the work of the Huntingdon's crew nearly done, there's the massive job of unloading what she's collected as cargo around the world. Anything up to 11,000 tonnes of meat alone. That would have been enough for half a pound each for the entire population of Britain. The crews have each covered well over 20,000 miles. As they take leave, their ships go into the hands of the skillful dock workers at the various great ports. But this was the really big one in the history of cargo shipping. London, the biggest and busiest port in the world. The 
biggest and busiest port in the world. The biggest and busiest port in the world. The biggest and busiest port in the world. Well, Anna, it's all over. It's all over. It's time to go. All right.